How's it going, everybody? I hope you're all having a wonderful day. In this week's build, we're making the ultimate, <laughs> that's right, the ultimate shooting board that is extremely precise, very dimensionally stable, and has a couple of tricks up its sleeve, and we're making it out of plexiglass. Let's get started. First, I wanted to explain what a shooting board is and why it is used. In essence, a shooting board is a finessing tool. So you can use a hand plane on a shooting board jig and feed a piece of wood into it and incrementally take small amounts of shaving off to get that piece to be perfectly square or take off a little bit of length in a very precise and exact way. Historically, shooting boards have been made out of plywood. And while plywood is generally considered to be dimensionally stable, especially the higher end plywoods like Baltic birch, I personally find that the shooting board is supposed to be a finessing tool that is supposed to be able to let you dial into the thousands of an inch or so. And for something like that, plywood is just not stable enough. As a result, in this build, we're using plexiglass to make our shooting board so that we never have to worry about wood movement ever again over years and years. In today's build, we are making the entire project out of two pieces of plexiglass that are 12 by 24 inches and are 3 eighths of an inch thick and half an inch thick. So the first thing I'm going to do is trim both of these pieces from 24 inches to 18 inches in length. With both of the lengths cut into dimension, we're going to take the thinner piece and rip this into 9.25 inches wide. Next, we're going to take the cutoff piece from the half inch thick plexiglass and rip them into three one and a half inch wide strips. We are now going to trim all three of these pieces that we just cut into 9.25 inches in length. Next, we'll be drilling a bunch of holes into the little strips that we just cut, as well as the 3 8 inch thick top. While this may not make a whole lot of sense just yet, it will make a lot more sense once we put everything together. With all of the cuts completed, these are the five pieces you should be left with. Next, we can go ahead and peel the little protective cover. And I'm going to move this out of the way and give a nice clean to this surface. I don't really know what type of product is supposed to be used to clean acrylic for, uh, you know, fusing purpose, but uh, I'm just using a glass cleaning fabric here. Okay, so now comes the big part. Uh, I'm going to use a product called Weld On, and this is supposed to be able to fuse acrylic almost like in a way that you're welding the material together. Um, this is fairly toxic material, so I am going to put a respirator on and then just kind of show you the process. But this is definitely one of those things that uh, I haven't really practiced enough with to know if we can really adequately or properly do this in such a massive area. Uh, so watch on and find out if this is going to work or not. All right, so we can take everything out and check out our results. 
Uh, you know, as soon as I put this on, I knew immediately that this wasn't going to really work for such a large surface. And while in my test sections, it worked really well, uh, this product really is intended for, you know, edge gluing like so. Uh, it works a lot better in that situation. This is just too big of a surface. So uh, I can't really fault the product. I can only blame the fact that I decided to go with it and took a gamble. With that being said, I'm not really worried about the structural integrity of this piece. There's plenty of strength along the seams where it did fuse together nicely. There's a couple little spots here and there and throughout where it fused pretty well as well so I'm not worried about the strength it just doesn't look very pretty as you can kind of see like this is what we were going for and these are the little spots and spatches that we've got I do want to sand the top surface with a higher grit sandpaper just to make the surface more cloudy so I can't see through <laughs> the imperfections uh, I guess that's the lesson you know if you make a mistake try to hide it to the best way that you can it applies to woodworking and clearly it applies to this plexiglass as well so with the top sanded to a frosty finish I am much happier with the way this looks the way it feels and of course the mistakes are a little bit less visible which is great now is a great time to focus on what the heck all of these holes that we drilled earlier are about so of course this being a shooting board we need fences right so the first one is going to be our 90 degree fence that's going to go in here and all of the holes in here lines up with the holes there so this is going to be a 90 degree um, and this is going to be our 45 degree right here now that being said, I really don't want to be finicking with the 90 degree. I always wanted to keep this in here permanently because that's going to be the vast majority of the time what we're going to use. So I made another piece right here that's going to be our 45 degree. I apologize, I didn't really cut the little corner here, but we will do that eventually. Uh, so essentially, whenever I need a 45 degree, I can use this particular fence and get a perfect miter. And when I don't need it, I can put it back here and let that rest and it'll always be available to me whenever I need it. I don't have to be finicking around trying to find that piece and so forth. Uh, and the 90 degree stays intact. If you look at this hole more closely, you'll realize that we drilled all the way through from the top section and left the bottom section undrilled. And the reason for it is twofold. First and foremost is I wanted this top hole to be oversized so that there's a little bit of playroom here. So if we need to adjust things and fine tune our angle perfectly and then bolt it down, we are able to do that. The second reason we did this is so that when we tap some threads down in here, it, the threads are only going to be on the bottom section. So when we crank everything down, it's really only pulling on the bottom section and it's not trying to play in any way or try to pull the two pieces that we fuse together apart. Because all of these holes were drilled at 3 8 and the bolts that we're using are 1 quarter, I can use the force bit of 3 8 to find the center of these holes and then drive a appropriate size bit to be able to tap the threads. All right, so we've tapped all of our threads and we've got our fence. While we could just kind of bolt all of these down together, that would kind of be irresponsible because as you can see, this surface is pretty slippery and when you're you know, pushing a hand plane down in here, you're introducing a lot of thrust in this direction. And it's very possible that this could ever so slightly move. So in order to prevent all of that, I'm going to use some sandpaper that has adhesive backing on, on the other side and I'm going to put it on this end so that it doesn't move at all because the sandpaper will grip down onto the board. Now that we have the sandpaper on the bottom, we're gonna get a lot more friction and we can go ahead and bolt this down. First, we'll put this down loosely and once we get pretty close, then we'll make use of the precision square to make sure everything is perfect 90. And then we can move the square in again just to make sure we do in fact have a perfect 90 degree in here. And if you want, you can take a feeler gauge like the one I have in here. I have the smallest one that I could find is one and a half thou and try and wedge it in here. And if you can't, then chances are it's square at least within one and a half thou of an inch across 9.25 inches, which is pretty good for what we're looking for here. All right, so off camera, I decided to finish the 45 degree piece and it is in its resting position. Of course, we already did the 90 degrees. Let's go ahead and test that out. We have one edges that's straight. We're gonna put this down in here, put our jack plane in here, feed the material down in, And that's how that's done. And we'll use a combination square to make sure it is square and it is bang on. And when we are ready to use the 45 degrees, we can take this out. Same drill as the 90, we loosely make it fit first. And then we bring in a trusted combination square that we know is going to give us a perfect 45. We can tighten it further. And then we can bring a piece that we want to finesse the 45 degrees onto. Same deal, feed it in and cut. 
As someone who is a hybrid woodworker that uses both power tools and hand tools in a practical way, I personally find the shooting board to be an immensely useful tool in my shop. Not only does it give you an extreme amount of precision, it also gives you a lot more control over the process. You can dial everything into the thousands of an inch if you needed to, and you can have a very precise and controlled cut along the way. Something that is not really possible with most power tools. If you're not a hand tool person, I highly recommend that you get a jack plane, not only just for this shooting board, but a jack plane is just tremendously valuable throughout all wood working projects you will encounter in the shop. And when you get a jack plane, be sure to make a shooting board like this and let me know what you think. Well, that's all for me guys. I hope you enjoyed this week's video. If you did, please be sure to hit the thumbs up button below. Consider subscribing to the channel if you're not a subscriber already. Thank you so much for watching. I greatly appreciate your support and I will see you on the next one.